Good afternoon, friends. My name is Tony. It's my friend Dave over here from Black Jacket. We're representing uh, our churches this morning. We are out here with the prayerful support of our, our pastors and elders, our Christian friends, and we're out here to bring you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no better news than salvation by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. No word for morning, man. No religion can bring you that good news. Islam cannot bring you that good news. Mormonism cannot bring you that good news. The Jehovah's Witnesses cannot bring you that good news. Buddhists cannot bring you that good news. Hindus cannot bring you that good news. Roman Catholics cannot bring you that good news. All of these other religions have something in common that differentiates them from the truth. All of the religions created by men, religions that have fashioned the God in their own image, they all say basically this, you must follow a set of rules, you must do good works, and maybe, just maybe, it'll work out for you in, in the end, if God decides to extend your grace. But you've got to do a lot of work to get there, and you'll likely never do enough. The Bible actually says the opposite. There's nothing you can do. You're lost. You've already sinned against God. The wrath of God already abides upon you. You are right now bound for hell apart from Christ. But if you turn from your sin and by faith and by faith alone receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will give you the gift of eternal life. Not because you're good, not because you're religious, but because of the mercy and grace of God as it was accomplished through the sacrificial death and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that though you are lost, you may be found. Every other religion doesn't say that. Every other religion says you're lost and maybe you'll be found. And so people work themselves into the ground. They become slaves to religious systems. Instead of becoming free in Christ. Jesus said it's the truth that will set you free. And you will be free indeed. None of these other religions talk about freedom. They talk about doing good works. Did you already walk by one, sir? Three times. Can we thank this gentleman for serving our country? Come on! We're able to be out here and do these things because of young men like that who are willing to live and die for our freedom. God bless you, young man. God bless you. Men like that, women like that deserve our respect. And if you couldn't bring yourself to clap for a young man who is willing to lay down his life for you, shame on you. Shame on you. Breaks my heart that everybody wasn't born for that young man as he walked by. He might be dead in a month or two, laying down his life so that we could get fat here in the United States. Some of you couldn't bring yourself to appreciate that young man. Shame on you. appreciate a young man like that? Do you honestly think you appreciate God? If you can't appreciate a young man like that, who's willing to lay down his life for others, when Jesus said greater love is no one than this, than he who lays down his life for his friends, if you cannot appreciate a young man like that, do you really think you appreciate God? Do you really think you appreciate Christ? And the sacrifice he made for sinners like you and me? If you cannot lift up a hand to say thank you to a young man who's willing to lay down his life for strangers like us, do you really think you appreciate God? Think again. Think again. Because ultimately, folks, we do what we care about. We do what we care about. If you claim to be a follower and a worshiper of Jesus Christ, but you do nothing to follow and worship Christ, if you worship Him with your lips while your hearts are far from Him, you don't care about Christ. Come on, remember your first car? If you don't have a car yet, you'll get a car someday. Remember your first car? Did you hide it in the garage? Did you put a tarp over it so no one could see it? Or did you show it off to your friends? Could you, could you wait for Saturday to come so you could pile your buddies into the car? 
It was probably a piece of junk, but you loved it. It was your first car. Couldn't wait to brag about it. Do you have a child? Have you ever had a child? Whether father or mother? Did you take any pictures of your children? Tell anybody at work that, that you have a son, that you have a daughter? Or did you keep it a secret? Come on, be honest. You wanted to tell the world about your child. Grandparents, do you love your grandkids? Do you keep them a secret? No. Are you engaged to be married? Do you show anybody the ring? Of course you do. You do what you care about. Millions of people in the world today say, I love Jesus. I care about Jesus. But they won't open their mouth for Jesus. They'll do everything to hide the fact that they're a Christian. They're embarrassed. They're embarrassed for anyone to know at work or at school that they're a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? If you're embarrassed by Christ, you don't know Christ. You don't know Christ. I apologize for getting a little bit upset, but it really hurt me that when that young military man walked by, that there were only a few of you who thought enough of him to thank him for his service. I'll be right behind you. That really bothered me. And it reminded me of how so many people take Jesus Christ for granted. And people will take Jesus Christ for granted on Tuesday as they sit around their trees, as they sit to have a, a wonderful dinner with family. Is there anything intrinsically wrong with that? No. Is it, is it wrong to gather and, and to, to bless one another and to enjoy one another's company at Christmas? Absolutely not. But if you do that without a care or a thought for Jesus Christ, then you're sitting against God. You're blaspheming God. Because we do what we care about. Do you realize what happened 2,000 years ago? No one knows the day or the hour that Jesus was born. He, he wasn't born in December. He wasn't born in December. He was likely born sometime in the spring. But this is the day over the centuries that Christians have chosen to commemorate the birth of not simply a baby, but hallelujah, praise the Lord. God bless you, sir. God bless you. This is not the day that Christians simply commemorate the birth of a baby. This is the day that Christians commemorate the birth of their king. The birth of their king. Jesus was not simply a baby born in a manger. He was God become flesh to dwell, um, to dwell among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, the Lion of the tribe of Judah who came to judge both the living and the dead. The preeminent one over all creation who was with the Father in creation. Nothing was made that has not been made by Jesus Christ. All things were made through him and by him and for him. This is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So much more than just a baby. Many people will celebrate Christmas on Tuesday while denying that Jesus is God. Listen to what the Word of God says about the incarnation of God the Son. God in the flesh. I'm going to be reading the first two chapters out of the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. God's Word tells us this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have forgotten you, or again, I will be to him a father, 
and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels live and his ministry is a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The center of uprightness is the center of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has appointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression of disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him for a little while, for who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies, and those who are sanctified, all have one source. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subjected to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The word of God. And I pray that God gave you ears to hear. when that baby was born in the most humble, yes, even humiliating of circumstances to be born in a cave or a barn, we're not sure which, but certainly it was a place where animals were out. Born surrounded by the dung of filthy animals, laid in a feeding trough where animals ate, and wrapped in swaddling cloths. That certainly is not the birth you would expect for a king. But that's who was born that day, King Jesus. 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And why? Why did he have to come? Why did he have to take on the form of human flesh? Why did he have to humble himself in that way? It's very simple. It really is. For only God can satisfy the wrath of God, and only man can pay for the sins of men. Only God can satisfy the perfect wrath of God, and only man can pay the penalty for man's sins. So the only sacrifice that would be adequate, the only sacrifice that would prevail over the wrath of God and exonerate the sins of men had to be a sacrifice that was both fully God and fully man. And that is why God the Father sent His Son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Fully God and fully man, yet without sin. A sinful man can only pay the penalty for his own sins. A sinful man cannot pay the penalty for other people's sins. And God the Father made him, God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that through him we might become, we might receive the righteousness of God. Listen again to what the Word of God says. Therefore, he had to be made, and this is speaking of Jesus, he had to be made like his brothers, humans, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation, that is another word for justification. That is another word for, for one taking on the penalty that another deserves. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We are not justified by our good works. Our sins are not erased. Our sins are not blotted out by being religious or doing good deeds. In fact, the Word of God says that to God our good deeds are nothing more than filthy rags. They are an attempt to bribe the judge. And no one who tries to bribe a judge when they're facing the sentencing of a judge is going to walk out the courtroom if the judge is a good and righteous judge. Oh, certainly we have corrupt judges in the world today. Yes, you could bribe your way out of a courtroom today, but if that judge is good, if that judge is truly upholding the law, your bribe is only going to get you into more trouble, not less. And the same is true with anyone who thinks that they will stand before God and presume to bribe Him with religion and good works. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and, and, and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? And Jesus said, I will say to them on that day, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. That's what's going to happen to those who try to bribe the judge with religion or with good works. God will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You're a lawbreaker. All I see is your sin. All I, all I see is the crimes that you've committed against me. And now all I see is you're trying to bribe me with your good works. The only way that we can be reconciled to God, the only way we can be made right with God, the only way we can be forgiven for our sins, the only way we can be set free is through the propitiation of God Himself, through the sacrifice of God Himself. Jesus Christ, the God-man, who knew no sin, who voluntarily went to the cross to suffer and die not for crimes that He committed, but to take upon Himself the punishment we rightly deserve for our sins against God. And so God could set us free not arbitrarily like a corrupt judge. He could set us free because His Son paid the debt that we owe. Jesus Christ, God the Son, paid the sin debt we owe to God when He shed His innocent blood on the cross. And then forever defeated sin and death when He rose from the grave. What do you think of that, sir? How you doing? Have a good day. Have a good day. Have a good day. God bless you, sir.
You need to understand this, my friends. God is just and God is love. The same God who will judge the world of wicked and righteousness, the same God whose wrath abides upon the ungodly, the same God who is angry with the wicked every day, is the same God who loves sinners, is the same God who will save sinners. God cannot love and ignore his justice. God will not be just and ignore his love. And there's only one place where justice and mercy are reconciled, and it is at the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is where justice and mercy kiss. Where God the Son satisfied the wrath of God, and where Jesus Christ, fully God yet fully man, paid the penalty for man's sins. The cross is where justice and mercy kiss. But my friends, you must come to Christ on His terms. God does not negotiate with sinners, just like a good judge does not negotiate with a convicted criminal. God does not negotiate with sinners. He did not negotiate with me. I did not bargain or bargain with God and come to some kind of compromise with God where I could still be in love with my sin and live my sinful life and God would just overlook my sin if I do some good things and allow me into heaven. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. God brought me to the knowledge of my sin against Him, that I have offended Him, that all of my sin against are against Him. Even David, who, who sinned against Uriah by having him murdered so he could steal his wife, who, who, uh, who encouraged Bathsheba to commit adultery with him, David, who was a liar, a, a murderer, a thief, an adulterer. David, who sinned against so many people. Even David, when he cried out in repentance, the first thing he said was, My God, it is against you and you alone that I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Yes, we can wrong people in our horizontal relationships, our relationships with people, but every one of our sins is a sin vertically against Almighty God. Every one of them. And my friends, if you think that God is going to overlook your sin, consider this. Let's say, just hypothetically, let's say that you are 20 years old today, and you started sinning against God when you were 10. Now you started sinning much, you started sinning 10 years before that. One of the first words you ever learned was no. Mommy and Daddy didn't sit you on their lap and say, now Johnny, we want you to disrespect us. We want to teach you how to disobey. Say no. Get angry. Cry. Stop your feet. Try to gouge my eyes out. Come on, you can do it. Your parents didn't do that. You did that because you were born with a sin nature. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But let's say that you didn't start breaking God's law until you were 10 years old. And let's say you're a relatively good person. And you only sin against God in thought, word, or deed three times a day. You're now 20. If you were to die today, that means you have a rap sheet against God with 10,000 entries. And you think you're going to stand before God and declare your goodness? Or you're going to say to God, God, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again? You think a judge in a courtroom who has a criminal standing before him with 10,000 crimes on his record is going to believe the guy when he says, I'm sorry, I'm going to try not to do it ever again. Think you ought to just let me go. No good judge is going to let you go. And God is holy. God is the infinite judge of the universe. And so he must but his sin. But he is also loving and merciful and gracious and kind. Not, not apart from or instead of his justice, but in addition to. All of God's character is perfect. All of God's character is perfect. But God can only forgive you in a way that is consistent with both His justice and His mercy. And so He made only one way, and that was through the cross. Again, where justice and mercy kiss. What God commands of you this day is that you repent, that you turn from your sin, and by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Now, I want to apologize if you've been into a church that tells you that all you have to do is ask Jesus into your heart, 
just pray this prayer and everything will be fine. All you have to do is accept Jesus. I'm sorry if you've been told that, because it's a lie. Jesus does not need your acceptance. You need his. Jesus is not lonely without you. You are not the missing piece in Jesus' life. Jesus is not incomplete if you're not with him in heaven. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is holy. He needs nothing from you, but he demands everything from you. You need to receive him as Lord and Savior. God doesn't need your acceptance. You and I need his. And praying a prayer or walking down an aisle or raising your hand does not make you born again. Salvation is of the Lord. It is God who causes someone to be born again. It is God who extends to a person the gift of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And so you may ask, well then how can I know if I'm saved? You'll repent and believe. You will repent and believe. And when you sin, you will repent and believe. There are no amount of penances you can do. There are no amount of prayers or beads you can rub that will exonerate you of your sin. It is only the shed blood of Christ. And you can be assured of this salvation. The Apostle John wrote, I have written these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you question, if you think you're saved and you question whether or not it's true, it could be because you are trusting in something other than or someone other than Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. If you're trusting in your own good works or your church attendance and Jesus for your salvation, you're not saved. Because salvation is by the grace of God alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So humble yourself before him. Turn from your sin. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And all of his promises are yes and amen. The same God who promises to judge is the same God who promises to save. And my hope and prayer for you is that the mercy and grace and love and forgiveness of God would be given to you today as you turn from your sin and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Remember, it was not merely a human baby that was born in that manger 2,000 years ago. It was God in the flesh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who, will, who would grow, who would live, and then who would die on the cross to pay the penalty for sinners like you and me. So humble yourself and receive him as your Lord and Savior today. While God has given you time. We have three uh, New Testaments. We have three Gospels of John. The green ones are in Spanish. The uh, brown ones are in English. We offer them to you as a gift. We don't want anything from you. We only want something for you. Please, please don't claim to be open-minded if you're afraid to open the book. That's hypocrisy. Don't claim to be a free thinker if you're afraid to open the book. God bless you, ma'am. Please help yourself. They are free, gratis. They are free. No salesman will come to your door. And I pray that you're blessed by the reading of God's word. Thank you for listening.